Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good to have you all here this morning for 11-11 celebration. So good to see all of you all. It's, a bit, it's, it's a, it feels starting to feel a little bit like winter time. That's nice. We're going to enjoy it for a few weeks, and then we're going to be sorry that it came, and because um, we love our Texas heat down here, right? Not, I mean, I was born in this area, but I love the cold, so I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Well, I'm so good to have you here this morning um, as we uh, continue our Advent series. This morning, we're in the second Sunday of Advent, and our series is on the, the gifts we receive, the gifts we open at Christmas, and uh, this one being today, the gift of peace that we'll be talking about. Before we begin with the music, I'm going to highlight a couple of announcements. First of all, make sure you register your attendance on a card. You can bring it up here when we do the offering. You can scan it with your phone, fill it in online if you'd like to do it that way, uh, but we love having, uh, knowing that you were here. Um, also, if, if you're visiting with us for the first time, check back at the sound booth, please, on your way out. Um, the the uh, Austin back there or one of the other guys will be sure and get you a copy of our band CD, um, and just so you can enjoy the music. We have a gift for you, and then, um, let's see, I'm thinking, of, I'm missing something else, but Wine and Wishful Thinking is going to be, uh, we're, we're postponing it for the rest of the month for the holiday season. We'll be picking it back up on January the 9th. Um, Winehouse has already got a bunch of parties and things that are happening there as well, so it's just going to work out better. We've been having a good group, uh, uh, quite a few folks gathering, but this, this Monday and until January 9th, we'll resume back then. Um, Winter Festival of the Arts, everybody. Pay attention. Make sure you mark it down December the 21st. Uh, it's a midweek. Elizabeth Wills will be our, our, our guest, featured guest artist. It's going to be an amazing concert. We've also got uh, storytelling, and, um, and then we'll have as our, uh, our, our special guest with Elizabeth is going to be Hannah Kirby. And some of you all remember Hannah Kirby from The Voice, and she came and she sang here one morning, and she's just a dynamite young woman and uh, amazing, soulful voice. So she'll be here as well that night. Then we'll be doing the drumming out there. We'll have our circle drumming, which is always fun. We always have a great group out there doing drumming, and it's our annual kind of thing. So we have drums if you don't have your own. It's family. It's a family thing, so bring, the, bring everybody. And um, that's it, I think, for, well, let's see. I was asked to announce a couple other things. There's a book discussion group, Advent, with, um, oh, well, I have to announce it. My wife gave it to me. So, um, yes, so Linda will be leading a book discussion, an Advent book discussion, Hope Against Darkness, Wednesdays, noon to 1.15, uh, starting December 14th, upstairs, room 350. So it's not in your bulletin, but uh, we'll try to remember to put it there next week, too. But uh, that's happening December 14th, noon to 1.15, and that is a, uh, an Advent book discussion. And then there's some other stuff that you can find in the brochures that are in the back. And also, folks, if you didn't have a chance to get the devotional guides, we have our, our, our Advent devotionals back here in a basket on the, on the soundboard. And be sure to pick those up. They're, they're really nice this year, and uh, they're just great things to reflect on from day to day. So this morning, uh, when, when Brad and Sherman and I met this past week, and we were talking about music, the, the most unlikely of musical artists came up. And um, we've, we've, we've broken a lot of ground in here. Um, so as I was talking to, the, to, um, to Kathleen Potter just a little bit ago, and we were talking about how what a great opportunity to come to worship because you discover all sorts of musical genres that you never knew existed. And um, you just wouldn't probably listen. But uh, this morning we're going to sort of venture into new territory we have a special song by Run DNC this morning. And we're so glad to have Jason here as our, our DJ. So I don't know that we'll be having a DJ regularly, but I kind of like it. So good to have you all here. Let's begin.
up the dough, give up the dough on Christmas, yo. Give up the dough, give up the dough, give up the dough. Here we go, here we go. I'm from the ghetto, and this mean I get no toys or presents beneath my tree. I wrote my list, I made my wish. Is this what Christmas means to me? No snowflakes dropping, can't go shopping. Rhymes I'm a popping to keep the hip hopping. Why can't a Santa pause for the cause? I'm getting mine, you getting yours. That's how Christmas is supposed to be. A very merry Christmas for everybody. Fight poverty, give to the needy. Don't feel like the Grinch, cause the Grinch is greedy. Deck the malls with boughs of holly. Tis the season to be jolly. No presents for my tree yet, and I don't even know what gifts I'm going to get. Happy holidays, not like a lot of days. A few here, a few there, a new year. Seasons, greetings are the reason for the cheer. If Santa Claus is coming to town, I hope it's my chimney he's coming down. On Christmas, yeah, Christmas is on Christmas. Because Christmas is... Give up the dough, give up the dough, give up the dough. On Christmas, yo. Give up the dough, give up the dough, give up the dough. Here we go, here we go. Give up the dough, give up the dough, give up the dough on Christmas, yo. Jason Esquire Barnes, ladies and gentlemen. Oh my gosh. Well, nobody's rushing to the door to leave yet, so I guess we're safe. <laughs> Guys, that was awesome. <laughs> okay, so um, I don't know what to say. Y'all, so let's stand up. It's hard to talk after that. Give up the dough. Actually, Brad and I thought maybe we should do this before the offering, and that would be awesome. <laughs> so um, we, uh, let's, let's have a prayer. Let's pray together. Holy One, this morning we are so grateful for this beautiful weather, for the change of weather. And even as we are grateful for the changes, we are mindful of the reality of pain that's in our world. We are mindful of tragedies that are happening out in California and then over in, in, in Seattle and Tennessee and, and, and then um, the, the, the Brazilian soccer team. And we are just so mindful of all of the pain that is in the world at the same time that this is a challenging season for many of us. And yet it is always the season of hope. It is that reminder that perhaps there's something else, still something else we're missing, something else that we're invited to participate in. For this chance to be in community together, to explore together, to be open, we give thanks and pray your blessing upon this. We pray in the name of one in whom we move and live and have our being. Amen. So here's an old song. and it's a, I don't know how many of you all know this song. It's a great old Christmas tune. Uh, Linda and I, when we were in uh, the Czech Republic and in Prague, we got to go to St. Wenceslas Square. We stood underneath the, the, uh, the statue there of King Wenceslas. Linda and I by ourselves with uh, dozens and hundreds of other folks, and we sang... Uh, good King Wenceslas, just by the two, of, the two of us. Couldn't get anybody else to join in. So um, here we are this morning. We're going to sing this great old tune. And I uh, hope you'll join in and uh, enjoy this. It's a great little sort of story song for Christmas time.
and bring me wine, bring me fine longs hither. Thou and I will see him dine when we bear him thither. Now and the wind blows stronger, fills my heart. I know not how I can go no longer. But my footsteps, my good page, tread thou in them boldly. Thou shalt find the winter's rage, freeze thy bloodless cold. Here we go. In his master's step he trod, where the snow lay dinted. He was in the very sod, which the saint had rented. Therefore, Christians, all be sure, wealth or rank possessing. He who now will bless the poor, shall yourselves find the wordiest Sunday ever. <laughs> Take a moment, would you please, and offer one another a sign of peace. And now, a special message brought to you by the Association of Eggnog Distributors. These are the good times for Bob and me. With so many things to be thankful for this season, we attended our 25th college reunion over Thanksgiving holiday. Bob's old girlfriend didn't remember him at all. <laughs> so I enjoyed it much more than the 10th. <laughs> and last month, with all the presidential elections, <clears throat> Always a fun time for us. Every four years, we make it a special occasion walking the two miles to our polling station. Bob always votes Republican. I vote Democrat. And then we laugh about how our votes make no difference whatsoever in the outcome. <laughs> hmm. And for Christmas, we no longer decorate or put up the, tree, the, the trees, the lights out of our house. Inside, we travel around town. Instead, we travel around town to see the houses with the really elaborate decorations and try to calculate all the time and frustration that went into that work. <laughs> but when I came home for after work on Friday to pick Bob up for our light seeing trip, I was surprised to see Bob sitting on the couch, still in his pajamas from the morning and brooding over a letter in his hand. hand. Bob, what is it? Is everything okay? I thought we were going to see the lights. Evelyn, I'm not going out anymore. What? What's the matter, Bob? It's this letter I received the other day. It's one of those chain letters. It came in the mail. Not over the internet. In the mail. Oh, Bob, you can't take those things seriously. Everybody gets them at some point. Although, most of them do come by email now. That's just it, Evelyn. It came in the mail. And it was addressed specifically to me. Listen to this. 
Bob, over the next three days, you will encounter three people from your past. This will be your opportunity to make things right or ignore them at your peril. Pass this letter on to someone else with best wishes for your future, your friend. My past has caught up with me, Evelyn. Oh, Bob, what past? That's what I'm worried about. The day after I received this letter, I went to a restaurant for some coffee and dessert, and this big guy came up to me, probably six foot three, in his mid-twenties, and probably weighed 250 pounds, and he was covered in tattoos and piercings and facial hair. He was really intimidating, Evelyn. And then he said in this deep voice, Hey, do you remember me? I didn't have a clue. Started worrying about what I might have done in the past to offend him. Maybe I denied his auto insurance claim because before I retired from the company. Maybe I cut him off on the highway or accidentally cut in front of him at the movie theater or grocery store. I mean, how are we supposed to keep track of these things? But I sure didn't know how to make it right, and I didn't want to make it worse, so I just got up and ran out of there. Bob, where were you? There was this new place in the neighborhood, Jackson's Coffee Emporium. Bob, I bet that was Edward Jackson. Who? Little Eddie Jackson, Bob. You remember the Jacksons boy? Our kids all played together at church 20 years ago. The Jacksons moved to Idaho, and I heard little Eddie recently moved back to Fort Worth to start up his new restaurant in the area. Oh, Bob, now he's probably worried that he did something to upset you. I don't know, Evelyn. It's more than that. Yesterday, I saw this woman at the grocery store, maybe 10 years younger, she was staring at me for the longest time as I stood in line. I mean, it was kind of uncomfortable. Then she came over and asked me if I remembered her, that she was the one who'd had my first daughter. I was shocked and embarrassed, and then suddenly, suddenly ashamed. Bob, is there something from your past I should know about? Honestly, Evelyn, I don't remember. I mean. No, no, there's nothing. I, I don't have any idea what she was talking about. A couple of people were scowling at me, so I just left the cart of groceries in the line and drove home. I'm not going out anymore, Evelyn. I'm afraid there's still a third person out there. Did that woman tell you her name? I don't know. I think maybe it was something like Betty or Bobby. Becky. I think she said it was Becky. Bob, I bet it was Becky Wickerson. Who? Miss... Wickerson, she had your first daughter in her kindergarten class. <laughs> she was Robin's first teacher. Bob, you're really letting this letter get to you. Besides, are you that worried about your past? Is there something else I should know? I don't know. Who knows? I mean, I'm sure I've done something wrong, made some mistakes, some... Choices I've regretted, I, I think. Well, who hasn't, Bob? And with your family, who could blame you anyway? <laughs> Honestly, those chain letters just play on our natural tendencies to feel guilty or ashamed about the past or afraid of the future. I think folks do that just to disturb the peace. But if there's one thing I know that can put peace, to put the past in perspective and make the present a little more peaceful, it's eggnog. Eggnog has natural mellowing to agents like milk and nutmeg and powerful antioxidants that just makes life simpler. Why don't I get some for you before we head out to see how much people, how much trouble people went to for Christmas this year? <laughs> This has been a message from the Eggnog Distributors of America. Last week we lit the candle of hope, and today we light the candle of peace. Please remember to read this part that says all, okay? Holy One, enlighten our hearts that we may have peace. Help us to remember the song of peace and goodwill that broke through the sky 
announcing your goodwill for all people. Help us to bring peace through serving, giving, listening, and loving, even when it is difficult. May this season of hope and joy remind us that we belong to each other and are made whole together. Amen. Sing with us, please. Come, O oh light, illumine my darkness. Come, O oh light, revive me from death. Come, O oh heal, hear my cry. Come, O oh spirit. more time together. Come, O oh light, illumine my darkness. Come, O oh light, revive me from death. Come, O oh heal, hear my crying. Come, O oh spirit. As we move into this Kairos time and hear the singing bowl, I invite you to be still, to focus on this moment that we are in together as a community here in this place, letting what has happened be, and not worry or think ahead to what is yet unknown, but just be together here in this time. May we pray. peace. It's something we talk about. It's something we aspire to. It's something we hope for. And yet it seems that in the days in which we live, there is more chaos than there is peace. In the world that seems to sometimes be spinning out of control, we wonder where this peace can emerge. We wonder who it is that will bring the peace to us. And then we come into a place like this and a moment like this. We become still even just for a moment. We realize that the peace is found oftentimes deep within our soul. And that one quiet place in which we hold in the midst of the craziness of life, in the midst of the uncertainty of the future, in the midst of all that has already happened, we cling to that which is true, that which gives us hope, and we find that peace comes to us 
and then it flows out from us in different ways for different ones of us. But may we, on this season and Advent, as we wait expectantly, may we be the ones who offer peace to the world. May we be the peace bearers. May we be the peacekeepers. May we be the ones who offer the peace to those who are sitting beside us now, to those who we meet as strangers on the street, and to all those to whom we cross our paths. May this day have even a moment of peace which can grow and change and transform not just us, but perhaps our world. Amen. Isaiah 11, 1 through 11. A green shoot will sprout from Jesse's stump, from his roots a budding branch. The life-giving spirit of God will hover over him, the spirit that brings wisdom and understanding, the spirit that gives direction and builds strength, the spirit that instills knowledge and divine awe. Divine awe will be all his joy and delight. He won't judge by appearances, won't decide on any basis of hearsay, He'll judge the needy by what is right, render decisions on earth's poor with justice. His words will bring everyone to awed attention. A mere breath from his lips will topple the wicked. Each morning he'll pull on sturdy work clothes and boots and build righteousness and faithfulness in the land. The wolf will romp with the lamb, the leopard will sleep with the kid, calf and lion will eat in the same trough, and a little child will tend them. Cow and bear will graze the same pasture. Their calves and cubs grow up together. And the lion eats straw like the ox. The nursing child will crawl, all, will crawl over rattlesnake dens. The toddler stick his hand down the hole of the serpent. Neither animal nor human will hurt or kill on my holy mountain. The whole earth will be brimming with knowing God alive. A living knowledge of God ocean deep, ocean wide. stars and black like darkened glass and glitter suggest that I go back inside and wait for warmer weather so here it's New Year's Eve again and everything And toast the gods in charge of rearranging all of the world is designed to remind you all of the light that you could find is inside under all. it like to be overjoyed in spite of daytime planners higher standards dreams defended there's not single thing that's turned out quite like I intended. And so you learn that holding on is nothing less than panic. When big things fall apart, then hearts get that much 
to remind you oh, of the light that you could find is inside under all of the noise. Are you scared to be just who'd get there the fastest but this frozen night it's only right to consecrate the madness all of the world is designed to remind you all of the light that you could find So I love the, this, this lyric of this song, Overjoyed. All of the world has conspired to remind us this notion that underneath, deep inside, here's the chance to be overjoyed. And it's always interesting to me to think about peace at this time of year because it's, it, it's, it always stands in counterpoint to the reality we live in. Every single, I don't know how many Christmases you've been through. I've been through a bunch, more insightfully perhaps than the more recent ones. Doesn't matter. Seems like every year at this time of year, there's always this juxtapositioning of the reality with the dream, with the hope. And the challenge, I think, is especially as we think about this season, this idea of gift of peace. Well, how do you receive this gift of peace? How do you actually make use of this idea of peace in this season we live in, in this time that we live in. So, first of all, what does it even mean, peace? So I'm not going to ask you a rhetorical question. I'll ask you flat out, and you can just shout it out, or you can raise your hand, and I'll point at you. But what does peace mean to you? Where have you experienced peace? One word, two word phrase. Stillness? All rightness. All rightness. As in not all wrongness or as in being okayness? As in both. All rightness. All rightness. Okay. Something else. Thank you. Inner calmness. Okay. Serenity. Thank you. Yeah. Some other ideas. What, is, what does peace mean to you? Where, or a place where you've experienced it? Home alone, and not the Macaulay Culkin home alone, but quiet home alone. Okay, yeah, and something else, yeah? Church, church experienced it here at church, even during an R, a run D&C song, yeah? Something in the back? I'm sorry, what? Understanding, understanding, and then Lynn was pointing at somebody. Holding the baby, all right. Really? You have mastered discipleship. You have mastered inner Zen calm. <laughs> so this interesting because I asked it of a group, our, our Wine and Wishful Thinking group this past week, and of course, very similar answers. And, and, um, 
It's interesting to me that, you know, at Christmas time too, we have images of, these, of peace. And, and yet we also live, many of us live with uh, this discontent reality in our, in our, in our, in our life. Um, the loss of someone we love, uh, some kind of disjoint, disjuncture in the family. Um, so maybe it's a personal crisis with any number of things, addictions or debt or any number of emotional issues. I mean, the reality is, is that it's, it's hard to have that sense of peace that most of us were echoing in here, calm, inner calm, peace, stillness, quiet, um, music. It's, it's, it's the same kinds of images came up. Now, I'm, in, I'm gonna encourage you to pick up these devotionals, uh, it, um, and, and so I decided I would use one of them to sort of highlight that you might wanna go and pick them up and read some of the other ones. But, uh, my, and I asked Mike if it was okay. Mike Marshall had one in for this week on the notion of peace. And it was his granddaughter. I don't know if you read this one. But his granddaughter, during the summertime, she came over this past summer. I think she's three or four, maybe four and a half. And she, um, they, they put out a pool. It was hot, and the kids were there. They put out an inflatable pool. And, and uh, as soon as the water was in it, his granddaughter was the first one to jump into it. And then she stood up as, as everybody was making the, moving around in chaos. And she sort of put her, her hand into her, into her palm. And she said, everyone be hush. And she did that a couple of times till so everybody got quiet. And then she said, here are the rules for the pool. <laughs> and then she started reciting rules, which Mike said were pretty bizarre in some of them. But it was clear after a while, he said, that some of the rules were particularly designed for her big brother <laughs> to prevent him from getting in and, you know, splashing and ca creating chaos seems to me that we do that at Christmas time. Seems to me that all of Christmas, as opposed to overjoyed, seems to be designed to try to create this sense of peace. But unfortunately, if you're like me, many of you after Christmas are wondering, it's gone, where'd it go? Did it ever show up here? There was some good high moments, but now it's back to the crunch. Now it's back to the routine. And now it's back to... Uh, waiting another 150 days until Hallmark starts their movie series, you know, for 121 days. We try to get control. We try to find this peace. We seem to miss it. And so here we have this biblical image, the peaceable kingdom, very familiar image. And um, if, if you remember the paintings, it's almost ubiquitous. Ubiquitous, you see these peaceful kingdoms. You see them as as uh, ceramic sort of little statues and decorations. This idea of lambs lying down with wolves, of of uh, calves laying beside uh, lions, kids playing with poisonous snakes. You know, there's a kid roaming around in the scene, and you have all these these completely dis. The, um, um, contradictory sort of animals, you know, carnivores with vegetarians, you know, sitting in this peaceful setting. And you think, how is that even possible? The problem is, is as, um, as uh, well, um, and I can't remember her first name now, but Borstein, who was a wonderful writer and an activist and also a, a Zen a student. She wrote in this book, It's Easier Than You Think. She says, a lot of the problem that we have with getting to this place of peace is because we are so conditioned in our responses that we never questioned our very, we never questioned our very conditioning. And so when we see things, we run right to the assumption, right to the familiar, and then we move on beyond. It's really hard to get underneath the conditioned responses. And so when you read devotions or you hear preachers talk about this peaceable kingdom, this vision of Isaiah in the midst of their Israelite kingdom, uh, once again, trying to be what God had expected them to be, once again, failing and focusing on the rich and the powerful and missing out on the poor and the, and the, uh, um, and the, and the stranger and the ostracized, and once again, here's the prophet coming up to the crowd saying, you forgot, you're still not getting there, here's what it's supposed to look like, and throwing this image out. And we think, well, it's just absolutely impossible. You can't get there. Why, why would we even think we could get there? So we don't really think about it. And I think maybe that's a subconscious thing we do. Feels hard, feels impossible. 
Can you ever imagine that happening? So we just leave it as sort of a Netherland kind of image, a beautiful sort of image, sort of like we love to see Jesus in the manger with all the pretty animals around. And, and we just sort of put things in safe places. It's so hard to get underneath. So here's, I want to suggest something, a couple of things. First, a quote from Einstein, one of my favorite theologians. And it's been echoed by other scientists and certainly other theologians, but he said, a human being is part of the whole. A human being is part of the universe, a part limited in time and space, though he experiences himself, his thoughts, his feelings as something separated from the rest. It is a kind of optical delusion of consciousness. What perhaps Borstein would say, just another conditioned response. He goes on and says, this delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. I believe in our culture right now, the, the common term that's being bantered around is called tribe. That now we are in tribes is the sort of contemporary understanding of our communities. The delusion that this is a kind of prison for ourselves, that we restrict our personal desires and affection to a few persons who are nearest to us. Our task, he says, must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circles of compassion, to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in this beauty. I think what's interesting about this insight of, of, of Einstein is that it's uncannily close to the idea of Christian theology's incarnation. God is present with us. Paul, Apostle Paul's notion, or Paul Tillich, the theologian's notion, that God is the very ground of being, that God is present with us, within us, underneath all the world conspiring to remind us deep inside. And also with Jesus' own teaching, does it not? Jesus' own teaching, which I read from, the, from Matthew 25 a couple of weeks back, when his disciples were saying, okay, you're leaving, you know, and Jesus says, well, don't forget, when you feed the poor, when you clothe the, the naked, when you give food for the hungry, when you, when you visit the sick, and when you visit the ones in prison, when you, when you encounter these strangers, that's when you're doing it to me. And to everyone you don't, then you're not to me. There's this notion of this connectedness with what is sacred already present underneath in between us. And yet, as a friend of mine once said, Miss Legato, to feel compassion toward another, ultimately, we have to learn to feel it for ourselves. I've talked about Miss Legato before. Miss Legato was a nurse at the Texas, the Tarrant County Medical Education Foundation. We just called it TC Murph, and I'm not even sure if it's still around over by Harris Hospital. I was a social worker just out of school, and I was working with a methadone clinic, and I had 122 um, narcotic addicts on my caseload. And as a 24-year-old, I would sometimes get pretty impatient, but not just as a 24-year-old. As a person who grew up in an alcoholic and abusive family, I was pretty impatient with, a, with substance abusers personally. I tried to rise above it theologically, spiritually, but I found myself very impatient with the lack of progress that folks would make sometimes. And because I had the power to decide just how much dosage of methadone they would get depending on their behaviors or the reports about them, because I had the power to also decide how their probation officers or their pro parole officers might deal with them dependent on how they've been or how I perceive they've been behaving. If someone were particularly sharp with me, I could get a little sharp back. And being young as I was, I figured it would help to assert myself even more. And there was a little bit of gratification I got in that. Although I have to admit I wasn't really in touch with it, but there was something I felt of being able to control this, uh, this situation in these folks' lives. And I remember Miss Legato took me aside once, and she's a little sh short woman who was at the time probably in her late 60s, maybe even 70, and I was 24. She took me aside, and she was one of these folks that would like, and I'm not kidding, she would grab someone taller and pull them down. <laughs> she was not intimidated. And even I towered over her a little bit, so she grabs me and she sits me down in the chair. And she says, she says, folks don't get mad at others as easily as you do when they're at peace with themselves. 
She said, folks don't get mad at others so quickly, as easily as you do, when they're at peace with themselves. We have to learn to begin to cultivate compassion for ourselves in order to open up the doors, widen the circles for others. She said, it usually means that there's something in you that you haven't been dealing with. And she said, the reality is, is that knowing that they have been, or that you have been, in a similar place as them, perhaps you can begin to experience that not only have they been in a substance abuse setting like you grew up, but they've also been in that place that longed for love like you did. When we can recognize the ground of our needs with one another, as well as the ground of our common problems and struggles, but the, the ground of our longing, if we can come to recognize that, we begin to open up the circle of compassion with others. There's a wonderful TED Talk online that uh, you'll have to look it up, but it's called Take an Enemy Out for Lunch. <laughs> now, I'm actually going to su suggest two things to you because I actually also saw another uh, a talk by another guy. It wasn't a TED Talk, but I just happened to stumble across it. And um, it was all about finding uh, uh, the way in which we label people. And you see if this is true for you. We label people as enemy, as, as friends or as enemies and then occasionally as strangers. But this fellow was saying, we've lost the art of, of seeing people as stranger. In other words, we jump right to enemy. If we don't know them, we just almost see them adversarially. So it's that challenge. Are we all right? Okay, we'll take just a moment here and help him. Do we have a, a is there a doctor yeah, in? Oh, Laura's a nurse right yeah. over there right now? Okay. Yes. All right, we'll just sit quietly for a moment. Austin, have you already contacted him? Yeah. Not only is Lisa a great singer, but she's also an emergency room nurse. <laughs> so. Well, I'm going to invite us to all stand at this point. I think maybe this would be the best because we're, we're going to have ambulances coming in here in just a moment. And, and then we'll clear the area out a little bit and invite you all to kind of make your way out the back entrances and such. Um, let's let's uh, just take a moment of silence, too, that we might, that we might also... Okay, yes, tonight there we have a caroling for kids and an afternoon program for families happening in here. Um, but I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll, you'll find more information on the way out. We're going to let the ambulance come on through here. The folks come on around. Um, come on over this way. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's, um, let's just take one another's hands and we'll have a word of prayer and then make our way out. Let's pray. Holy One, we, uh, we lift up our friend and we pray for him and we uh, lift him up right now that he might have strength and might find some inner, inner calm and, and strength to, uh, to rest through this for just a moment. We ask blessing upon him as uh, the, the emergency workers are here.
We ask blessing upon each of us as we make our way throughout this week that we might be open to ways in which we can share compassion, we can share a common sense of who we are, the needs that we share with one another, the longing we share with one another, that we might open these circles of compassion wider, that we might in fact realize the peaceable kingdom is even a possibility, a path we can participate in this day. Bless us as we leave this morning. Amen.